Hey, Whitney. You're uh, you're muted. I can't hear you. Oh my gosh, that's hysterical. So people have just been watching me do this for like the past minute. <laughs> Sorry about uh, that. I clicked the I clicked the link, and for whatever reason, it didn't. Um, I don't know. So it was it was showing me as a waiting to be waiting to join, but I'm I'm ready to go. So awesome. Well, perfect. Yeah, people are just filing in. Um, guys, uh, I'm sure we have got an action packed um, session today. Tons of questions. If you have questions, I want to make sure that you guys have found your um, chat box as well as your Q and A box. I'll help moderate the conversation. Dump your questions in there. Um, this is a live show. I'm going to read kind of like a pre-recording because we are uh, transitioning this into a podcast. Uh, also, whatever questions that we don't get answered in the body of the show, um, I'm going to, you know, if you guys know me, there's an after party, so don't go anywhere. Even though I say thank you so much and we'll wrap up. Don't go anywhere. Okay. Because we will get through the remainder of the questions that maybe we're like, we'll kind of open the floor, so to speak. So let, let's get going here. Get things situated on my end. So Welcome, guys, everybody, to the Passive Investing Made Simple Masterclass. If you guys don't know me, my name is Whitney Elkins Hutton. I'm the Director of Investor Education here at PassiveInvesting.com. And like I said, this is a live show. So we dive deep into the various topics related to passive investing um, and help you learn not only the knowledge, but how to put the knowledge into tangible use so you can confidently go into making your first or next passive investment. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you've registered at PassiveInvestingWithWhitney.com. There you will get to see all the future master classes. You'll have a chance to register for those. Uh, you can also jump on my schedule if you want to talk shop about real estate and passive investing. I'd love to do so. And you know, just to be able to see our open deals here at PassiveInvesting.com, don't forget to register there. So. I want to bring in on today's show a very special guest, Scott Marr, um, Vice President of Avanta IRA. Um, Scott, we've had you on the show. You're a return guest. Thank you so much. But take a little bit of a moment just to introduce yourself and, you know, just how did you get into the self-directing world and real estate in general? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Whitney. I appreciate coming back on and hopefully everybody will get a, a little bit different information, I think, today than what we maybe covered last time, or at least trying to expound on, on what we talked about last time. Uh, I got into the self-directed world and the retirement plan world all the way back in 2006. Uh, when I started with, I actually started with Advanced IRA and did not know much about what we're talking about today. So I've spent the last 15 years myself uh, educating, uh, getting educated about what we do. Uh, it didn't take me 16 years, by the way. I got it done a lot quicker than that, but I'm still learning though. There's always still a few changes that come here and there uh, with an IRAs and 401ks. So that's how I got started. I was uh, brought in to help grow a, a company that was still in, in its infancy. Uh, I was the fourth uh, employee of Advanta IRA back in 2006, and we're up over 30 plus people now with uh, offices in both the Tampa Bay and uh, Atlanta areas. So I'm actually coming to you today from uh, the Atlanta area. Awesome. Well, fantastic. So Scott, you kind of left out a little bit about your background here. You're <laughs> not just this guru in the self-directed IRA space. So right. what makes you such an expert in this area? Well, I, I mean, by degree, I don't know if you, can you see my slide right now, Whitney? Um, I can, yeah, my, my can. bio. So yes, you can see on my bio there. I'm a licensed attorney. So I've been a, a licensed attorney in the state of Florida since 2006 as well. Um, and kind of when I don't really practice law from a, from a self-directed standpoint, I don't give any legal advice. I'm not allowed to give legal advice to our clients and, and potential clients, but um, gives me a good understanding of the background of the rules and what's involved. Um, and as far as the real estate, I mean, kind of in, in my role at Advanta, even when I, when I first started, one of the things I was tasked with doing was attending various real estate investment groups. And, and at that time, it was mainly just places I could go and and be in person with a real estate investor crowd um, in, in, in the Tampa Bay area. So I got to, to go to a lot of those meetings, learn quite a lot from a lot of different people, the, you know, the Pete Fortunatos, John Chobbs of the world, other uh, guest speakers that had come through and kind of took that. And that was a good building block for me, uh, not only to learn a lot about the real estate, but real estate investors, what they're looking to do, how they structure different deals. And then probably about four or five years ago is when I really got much more into and, and learning a lot more about the multifamily and the syndication side 
of real estate investing. I don't know if that's, you, you probably know better too, if that's a time when that type of investments really started taking off or people became more aware of it. But that's really my education on that side of, of real estate investing started about four or five years ago at a, at a national conference and just again, built from there. And I've gotten to meet so many different people uh, in the real estate investing community. Um, again, that just helps me grow my knowledge and, and I like to share what I know to help them grow theirs. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So today I just wanted, I, we have so much to cover today. And last time we talked about self-directed IRA. So the uh, traditional 401 or excuse me, traditional IRA, Roth IRA today, I wanted to bring you back to talk about the qualified retirement plans. So just in layman's term, what does a qualified retirement plan and how does that differ from the, you know, kind of the more traditional self-directed IRA that we've been discussing already. Really, so a, a qualified retirement plan, typically when you're talking about that, you're talking about an employer-sponsored plan, um, as opposed to an IRA, which really is driven by an individual and their ability to make their contributions just due to, simply due to the fact that they, they have a job or have income and compensation. But a qualified retirement plan uh, are plans that are typically sponsored through employers, whether that's you're working for a Fortune 500 company with a 401k plan, or whether you're a sole proprietor uh, as, and you're, you're a business owner yourself and you're sponsoring uh, your own 401k. That's really what we're going to probably focus on today uh, are those smaller plans, which some people call them QRPs or, or which stands for Qualified Retirement Plan. Uh, we refer to them as solo 401ks. They are interchangeable terms. Uh, but that's what's a little bit different. So qualified retirement plans, as we'll talk about today, have some different rules uh, involved as the, the IRAs. And, and some of that has to do with the contributions. Some of that has to do with, with how those plans are invested and, and what you can do with them as well. Awesome. And I know you have a presentation for us. So why don't you go ahead and you know launch into this? And I've got a few more questions for you. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Just interrupt me as we go through. And I'll, I'll start by um, saying, you know, I, I work for a company, I actually go back a slide here, I uh, work for Advanta IRA, we're a, a self-directed retirement plan administrator. So hopefully a lot of people on the call are familiar uh, with self-direction. We have over $2 billion in assets uh, under management uh, through our Tampa and Atlanta offices. Um, but again, I mentioned we, we primarily deal with self-directed accounts. We are not a brokerage firm. We don't deal with stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. We deal with real estate investors and, and people investing into private hedge funds or uh, private startup companies and things of that nature. And essentially a self-directed account is one, a retirement account simply giving you the ability to choose your own investments. You know, that's what the, the genesis of the term self-directed, you are directing the account, not being pigeonholed into specific investments by a brokerage firm uh, or possibly a financial advisor. So these are people investing in assets outside of uh, the stock market uh, and into alternative assets. There's a lot of different things that the IRS will allow you to invest in. Uh, and as far as why people choose to self-direct it, it really can be a, uh, simply a cash source. People want to use a different source of capital to do it. They have their retirement account uh, is another bag of money that they have in addition to say their personal savings or other income that they have. Uh, for other people, it's a tax decision. Uh, investing, as we'll talk about, as we talk about the different types of accounts, there's some major tax ramifications to these, diff to these accounts, not only on an individual basis, but certainly on the gains and profits you may make inside these retirement accounts. So sometimes investing with an IRA makes sense from a tax perspective. And certainly there's a lot of people who are simply fatigued and overwhelmed uh, with the stock market uh, and, and would rather find other types of investments to make um, as part of their retirement portfolio. So looking to really truly diversify, not diversify among publicly traded assets, but diversify among different asset classes uh, altogether. Um, so the accounts I kind of wanted just to, to cover today, we're going to spend, again, more time on the qualified retirement plans, but there are, you know, the self-directed plans are typically traditional or Roth IRAs. Uh, there are SEP IRAs, which I will touch on uh, briefly, because I think, again, for the people listening to this call who are sole proprietors, you own your own business, or maybe you even have a side business, um, in addition to, a, say, a W-2 that you're working, uh, the SEP IRA, and then especially the Solo K or the QRP plan are, are going to be especially I think accounts that you want to take notice of, find out what you can do with your side business, with your sole proprietorship to really maximize uh, the amount of money you have in a retirement account. Uh, and then certainly former employer plans are, are other funds that can be self-directed. Um, but just to kind of lay a, a base foundation, a lot of people are familiar with traditional and Roth IRAs. Uh, there are accounts that again, just about any individual can have one. 
Uh, as long as you have earned income, you can make annual contributions to a traditional Roth IRA. Um, they're treated a little bit differently for tax purposes. Traditional IRAs, um, you get the tax benefits up front. You get deductions on your tax return for making contributions. So it'll, it'll lower your tax basis now, but you are gonna pay tax on that money uh, when you pull it out in retirement. Well, Roth IRAs work uh, really the inverse is your tax benefits are at the end. So you do not get deductions for contributions to Roth IRAs up front, but that money is going to grow uh, completely tax free. So, so the good thing is they're very portable. You can move money from one IRA to another account between different custodians without issues with traditional IRA. But the drawback, and this is really what's going to hit home when we talk about the SEPs and the qualified retirement plans and the solo Ks, is that you are limited with a traditional and Roth IRA to how much you can contribute each year. You're limited to about six or $7,000 a year is the most you can contribute out of your pocket to one of these types of IRAs. So if you are someone who's looking to get started and get, hey, I really need to get my retirement plan moving, um, it's gonna take longer with these types of accounts because the contribution limits uh, are low. Um, the other aspect is that when you, when you get income to these IRA accounts, if you're invested in a leveraged real estate investment, you can be subject to something called UBIT or UDFI tax that we're gonna talk about uh, in a little bit. Don't worry too much about that uh, at the moment. Um, there are SEP IRAs, and these are uh, especially for people who, again, who are self-employed, sole proprietors, independent contractors, or people who maybe have a side business. Um, they work just like a traditional IRA in that you get a tax deduction for your contributions to the SEP, uh, that you make each year and your money is going to grow tax deferred, you will pay tax in retirement. But the huge difference with a SEP IRA is how much you can contribute. Uh, instead of that six or $7,000 number, you can contribute upwards of 60 or $61,000 a year into a SEP IRA based on your self-employment uh, income. Uh, SEP IRAs are also subject to that same tax we're going to talk about. Uh, and there are some requirements that if you have employees, that you have to contribute for them as well. So that's kind of a, a drawback of a SEP IRA account. Uh, but it does allow for much larger contribution limits. I have, a, I have a slide coming up in a minute that will show you kind of the, really the differences between this account and the IRAs. And then especially as we talked about here, um, the solo 401k, again, also called a qualified retirement plan or a QRP. Like the SEP, this is geared for people who are sole proprietors, people who are independent contractors, people who have a side business, the benefits of the QRP, like the SEP, large contribution limits. You can contribute that same upwards of $61,000 a year out of your business into a qualified retirement plan or solo 401k. You can put both Roth and traditional funds into that same plan. So as opposed to every all the money being tax deferred, you can actually make larger Roth contributions. With solo 401ks and with QRPs, you can borrow personally. You cannot borrow money from an IRA account personally, but anyone who's been involved with a 401k through an employer may know that you have the ability at times to borrow against that plan. And these plans are no different. Even if you are self-employed, you can still take personal loans. The gains on the leveraged real estate are not subject to that UBIT UDFI tax that we're going to talk about in a minute. So again, just remember 401ks, no UBIT tax, IRAs, are subject to UBIT tax. And so it's a huge benefit, again, that the solo K and the QRP has, especially when you talk about people investing in syndications and leverage real estate investments, that tax simply isn't going to apply. You can also get checkbook control of your retirement funds, where you actually can write checks out of an account. You can get that level of control using a QRP without needing to set up like a separate LLC for an IRA or something like that. It's a little bit separate topic, but uh, basically a lot more freedom and flexibility. The only drawbacks with a 401k or a QRP is they do, ex the IRS, you know, not just anybody can set up a QRP. Again, anyone can set up a traditional Roth IRA if you have income, or if you have an old 401k plan, you need to roll over, you can set up an IRA. But when you're setting up a solo K or you're setting up a QRP, the IRS does expect that you have a valid business or a side business that has active income and that at some point you actually make contributions to that plan as well. They do not like it when individuals simply set up a solo K in name only. Uh, they do want you to have a sponsoring business and they do want you to make contributions uh, on a somewhat regular basis. Now there is no formula, there is no exact amount you have to contribute uh, each year, 
but that is something that you would at least want to be cognizant, cognizant of when you're looking to make these types of, of plans. I think there's some people get the idea that uh, I could just set up a QRP uh, for any reason or a solo K, uh, but the IRS really does expect you to have a valid business or a side business and also make contributions uh, at some point as well. All right. So how let's you kind of gone over at a high level of the different types of accounts. How does one choose like what's best for them? I think when well, certainly again, if you don't have a side business or or a sole proprietorship, then I don't think that you know you can't have a QRP or really or or even a SEP IRA. You're, you're kind of pigeonholed in having that traditional Roth. When it comes to deciding this, like say a SEP IRA versus a solo 401k. For people who do have, who are self-employed uh, or have a side business, I think deciding among them really probably depends on what types of investments you might wish to make and what, con what kind of compensation that you take as well. Um, if you're looking at investing in assets that are not leveraged and you're not going to have to worry about the UBIT or UDFI tax that applies, a SEP IRA could be easier to administer because your IRA custodian is going to take care of all of your tax reporting. For the SEP IRA, if you do have a QRP or a solo K, you are trustee of your own plan and are thus required to make sure you do the proper reporting. So I, I think for someone looking at which one is going to be better than the other, there's a couple, again, just to recap, a couple factors. What types of investments am I making? Am I, am I going to generate that potential for that UBIT or UDFI tax that applies to leverage real estate investments? And am I comfortable doing some of the reporting involved, or do I have a tax advisor who might help me with that? Now, at Advanced IRA, we have changed our model a little bit. We can now assist with that tax reporting as well. So you're not kind of on your own if you're doing the QRP. Um, but I think it's a good discussion to have with a CPA, uh, Whitney, especially is, is looking at your income and, and figuring out which type of an account uh, you might be better. And, and kind of one example of that is just looking at the plan Here's the plan contribution limits, and that'll lead into my next slide, I think, that might help answer your question. So you can see, as I mentioned, with a traditional Roth, you can put as, as much as $6,000 a year. With a SEP, it's up to $58,000. And with a solo 401k, you're actually upwards of $61,000. So the, the upper limits of the SEP and the solo 401k are very similar, but how you get to that number is much different. So with a SEP IRA, it's simply maximum of 25% of your compensation up to $58,000. That's it. That's, that's the simple formula. With a solo 401k or QRP, you as the employee can defer the first $20,500 of salary into the plan as the employee. And is, as the employer, your business can do up to a 25% match to where the combined employee-employer contribution is at $61,000. And what that looks like then kind of on contributing, if you take somebody who has $100,000 as a sole proprietor of compensation in a given year, the most into a traditional Roth is $6,000. Into a SEP, the most they can do is 25% of that $100,000 or twenty-five dollars And where the solo 401k and the QRP come into play is that same individual, because they can defer the first $20,500 of their salary, they actually get a much larger contribution, as you can see on this slide. You get up to $45,500 a year with a QRP. So if you don't necessarily have a lot of compensation or you don't want to have to max out and claim a lot of earned income, the solo 401k will allow you to get a much larger contribution yearly than a SEP IRA would. It's, it's a little bit, I hopefully it didn't go too fast through some of that, but the key point is the less compensation you have, the greater the ability for the solo 401k to get closer to that max contribution. Um, if you had a compensation of $500,000, you're going to max out on the SEP or the solo 401k either, either way you go. But if you had say a hundred thousand, that's what your CPA says, Hey, let's not claim a bunch of compensation or earned income from your business. Cause we want to keep our self-employment taxes down. Then by doing, by keeping your compensation down, you would get a much larger contribution through a QRP or solo 401k than you will Obviously, either the traditional Roth or the SEP IRA account. Mm, okay. So thank you for breaking down like, you know, the different types of accounts and how one can fund those accounts. I'm curious though, and maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit. How can you invest in real estate and what impact can our investor expect to see? 
so with so kind of talk about i guess we could jump forward maybe a little bit to the rules of self-direction because when you have a retirement account um, again what we were talking about just now is simply you taking money out of your pocket and putting it into an account uh, on an annual basis but once that money goes into an account you have to decide where to invest it. If you just put it in his cash, it's going to sit there and, and do nothing or earn less than 1% bearing interest. So you need to get that money working. So the choice then becomes, what investments should I put this money into? You know, what, what investments are going to give me the greater returns? What investments are I going to feel more comfortable with? And a lot of people associate retirement accounts, and this is something we fight on a daily basis at Advanta, people associate brokerage assets. They associate the stock market with their retirement account. Um, it's kind of something people just been conditioned to believe almost that you have to have your money in a Fidelity or you have to have it in a Schwab account or a TD Ameritrade. Uh, and those are the investment options you have. But the IRS rules for retirement accounts say the only things you can't buy are you can't buy life insurance and you can't buy collectibles. Nowhere does it say in the code that you have to invest in publicly traded assets. So what we do at Advanced IRA, what self-directed accounts allow you to do is invest in things that are outside of the stock market. So whether or not it's, you don't have to put your money into mutual funds or stocks uh, or, or things that maybe you just feel like you can't control. So when you're making say a $50,000 contribution a year into a retirement account within two or three years, you got plenty of money to, you know, to make some, some serious investments with, and especially in the real estate space. Do you wanna put that money in the stock market? Uh, do you trust that? Do you understand what, what's going on there? Or do you, are there other options that you may have. And that's what self-direction really allows you to do is to buy a rental property, a single family property, um, a syndication investment, maybe make a loan from your, your IRA or 401k to somebody else. So you're able to drive the returns by choosing the investment that you're most comfortable with. Mm. And I see here on the slide under the self-directed rules, and you've alluded to it a few different times, the whole UDFI tax. Y Yes. So this is a, a little known tax um, that within IRAs, and now say it doesn't apply in brokerage accounts because you're investing in publicly traded companies. But when you're investing into to real estate investments, there's a tax called UBIT or, or uh, unrelated business income tax. It's also referred to as UDFI, unrelated debt finance income. It applies um, to an IRA in receipt of business income like you're getting you know, a cut of the take each month from a restaurant says, hey, here's part of our profits each month. You can subject your IRA to a tax there. But in the context of real estate investments, if your IRA or for, if your IRA, I should say, is invested into a leveraged investment. So you invest in, let's say your IRA puts a down payment down on a piece of real estate and obtains financing for the balance. That's a leveraged real estate investment. And your IRA is going to be subject to this UDFI tax. Or if you invest into a real estate syndication that is raising a uh, million, you know, could be raising millions of dollars, but there is still going to be underlying debt, a portion of the income going back to your IRA account will be subject to this UDFI tax. So it's a way that the IRS, it's a tax the IRS has to help um, level the playing field somewhat with IRA accounts and making other investments. But as you can see in the red, the red lettering there, Solo K plans, QRP plans do not pay that UBIT tax on leveraged real estate investments. So if you're looking to invest in a syndication and you're concerned, hey, this tax that may apply to my IRA account, uh, if I can set up a solo 401k instead, I'm not going to have to worry about it. And the tax impact of the UBIT, uh, it, it is at trust tax rate. So those ramp up much more quickly to that higher, I think, 39.6% rate. Um, so by using a solo K, you're avoiding this tax altogether. So uh, yeah, I think even with IRAs, the tax can be overstated at times. It still doesn't apply as much as people think it might, but it is something you have to calculate. It's something you have to file a return on when the tax is due. And obviously that's going to eat into uh, a portion of your return. The benefit of the solo K is you just take that all out of the equation and you don't even have to worry about filing the return, calculating the tax or having an impact, you know, whatever the returns are that you're getting uh, from your investment. All right, so why? Why is it that, that we are handed this magical gift of avoiding yet another tax? I, I honestly, I'm, I don't know the answer to that, Whitney. Um, I think 401k plans in general um, have some more flexibility 
than IRA accounts. Like I said, with IRAs, you have to have a custodian. You have to have a, a company actually that is going to hold the assets and do all your tax reporting. Um, with a 401k, the IRS rules allow you as a, to be your own trustee, to handle the cash yourself in an account by yourself and do all your own reporting. Um, and, and a lot of times 401k plans, and you think kind of beyond what we're talking about, you know, we're talking about you as an individual having your solo 401k. But when you think about larger companies uh, out there that are offering 401k plans and they're using, you know, maybe there's some private, uh, you know, 403bs, which are, are basically 401ks for public school teachers. Um, those types of plans that might have larger funds where they're able to make investments, they've taken out you, but I think from some of those to allow those larger endowment funds and investment funds for 403bs um, to actually invest into things and not worry about you. But that, that would be part of my guess. Um, when you think about like state, um, state retirement systems that have a large amount of cash that they're holding for their pensioners and they're able to invest that money, it frees up millions of dollars or billions or trillions of dollars probably from those funds to be placed into leveraged investments. Um, so it gives capital to people who need it and without having to have that UBIT consideration going back to those. But because it's a solo 401k and it's a type of qualified plan, the IRS rules for UBIT do not make any distinction as to whether it's a one participant plan or whether it's a you know 10,000 plus participant uh, qualified plan. Oh, very in interesting. I love it. <laughs> so what goes into the maintenance of these type of accounts and reporting? You've alluded to that a couple of times. And then I'm curious, what kind of audit risk does this pose? That, that's, a, that's a great question. So kind of with, with the types of accounts you can see here on the kind of the pros and cons of say IRA versus a solo 401k, the reporting on IRAs is, is again, done by your custodian. So your custodian is going to report you the amount of contributions you make to the plan. That's going to report the amount of distributions that you take out of the plan. That's really all that's going to be need to be, need to be reported on the IRA side. Of course, if there's UBIT tax, you'll have that return as well. Uh, but there's not as much uh, to do on the IRA side because your custodian, quite frankly, uh, is going to take, take hold of that and, and be responsible for it. Now, with the solo 401k, if you're the trustee, you have to make sure that the appropriate reporting is being done uh, to the IRS as well. Now, a key caveat to that, I don't know if I have this, I don't have this on the slide, 401ks are not required to file any type of information or returns with the IRS until the assets of the plan exceed $250,000. Now, at that point, the IRS does require the 401k plan to file what's called a Form 5500EZ uh, each year going forward that essentially states the total value of the plan, uh, the you know its assets, any contributions. Um, but that's about it. You don't have to report the assets that you hold. It's kind of, you just have to report the cumulative value of the account. Um, but also if you take distributions from your 401k at some point, you as a trustee need to make sure that the plan is issuing a 1099 as well. Again, with IRA accounts, your IRA custodian has that responsibility. So with 401ks, um, you're going to get more freedom and flexibility and you're going to avoid the UBIT tax, but you also have to make sure that the plan files the appropriate 5500 EZ or the 1099 forms, the 1099 R's uh, when required. Um, again, Advanta can assist with that. That's something we just added this year to be able to file the help prepare the 5500s and help prepare the 1099 R's. Uh, but you as a trustee are ultimately responsible for that. So that is some of the um, added, I guess, reporting requirements for 401ks. But again, a lot of our clients who are using them, the benefits uh, far outweigh those. And, and for again, for a lot of people, none of that reporting is required until the assets are over $250,000. All right, I know, I'm gonna throw you, a, and it's not a curveball because you and I have talked at length about this, but you mentioned checkbook control earlier. Mm -hmm. And I know, I mean, many of the investors on here know or heard probably throughout November, December, January, that the checkbook control is dead because of a case called McNulty versus commissioner. Now, can you walk us through a little bit about those findings? And now that we're a little bit further away from the decision, what was actually unveiled there? I can, yeah. So McNulty v. commissioner, yeah, it's kind of rocked people a little bit. And I think people... Uh, my personal opinion, people are reading much more into it than is there. So what McNulty v. Commissioner was about, you had a taxpayer who formed with their IRA account what's called a checkbook LLC. And that is where your IRA becomes the sole member of an LLC and you get to act as manager 
of that LLC and you open up a bank account in the name of the LLC for your IRA to deposit all the cash into. So it takes the cash out of, away from the, your custodian and puts it into a bank account for you to control. And, and as manager, you can make all of your investments in and out of that LLC. You can buy real estate, you can buy notes, you can buy syndications, all using that particular LLC bank account. Now what this taxpayer did in McNulty was they used their checkbook LLC for their IRA account to buy precious metals. Now, when IRS rules regards to buying precious metals in your IRA, if you want to buy physical gold and silver, your IRA can do that. And the rules are absolutely fine with you purchasing those types of metals. But there is a requirement by the IRS that you hold those metals be held outside of your direct control. So you cannot hold the IRA. You know, if your IRA buys gold or silver, you can't just have the metals shipped to you and you hold them uh, in your personal save. It has to be held through a third party you know, depository company to hold those metals. Well, what this taxpayer did in McNulty is they felt that using their LLC as a shield to buy the metals and they, they would then be allowed to store them at home. And that's something that we, I would have told some of that taxpayer that if, they'd been a, if they'd been a client of ours, you can't do that because the IRS even had a little note on their website that said using an LLC does not get around this requirement. So the taxpayer challenged the IRS decision. They lost. The IRS said, you, you know, per what we said, you cannot act as the custodian of the metals in your account. But in that same decision, they did not say in there that you could not be the manager of, your, of an LLC. And in fact, they referenced a couple of cases where the tax court had said in the past that you could act as manager of an LLC. You can make investments. You just can't hold, personally hold on to the actual investment itself. So if you're gold and silver, if you're buying gold bars or gold coins, that is the investment. You cannot physically hold that uh, yourself. And so there's been some other talk. Does that extend to people investing in crypto where they're buying you know, on, on, the, on the little crypto sticks, the, the, the cold, cold wallets, possibly? But overall, this checkbook structure itself is alive and well and is fine. And if the IRS has challenged that, they challenged it years ago and lost and haven't challenged it again. This case was specifically about a taxpayer trying to buy, use the LLC to buy precious metals that they could store in their house. Hmm. What are some other things that land investors in hot water around this? Um, so I, I think if, well, we talk about the checkbook control, I mean, in IRAs in general, you have to be careful with, with self-dealing. Um, you cannot use your IRA or 401k account to benefit you personally or to get, or you, and you personally cannot get benefits from your assets owned by your IRA or 401k. So if you were to invest in real estate and buy, say, a single family home um, that you're, you want to rent out, you are not allowed to use the property. That, that'd be you getting a personal benefit from the investment in your account. Um, you can't do the work on the property. So your IRA or 401k would have to pay a third party to do it. So I believe, you know, especially with the checkbook control where you have the ability to write the checks to your contractors, or mistakenly send that check to yourself to pay yourself back or something. That's what I, what I think the danger is for people getting involved with either checkbook LLC or just IRAs in general is making sure that you're staying on the right side of that self-dealing rule. You can't sell something to yourself. Uh, you can't lend money or, or buy things from certain family members. Uh, that's something we educate our clients about when asked a question or, or talking to somebody up front and talking about the rules. Um, but with the checkbook LLCs, that, that is one danger area because you, because the taxpayer has control of the checkbook and from there they can, you know, they make the investment decisions, write the checks and send the bill. So I think that's, that's typically a danger for people, but outside of that, I mean, your custodian, especially if you're using an IRA or a solo 401k, um, you know, especially at Advanta, we're going to be able to answer those questions for you, uh, as to what's allowed, what's not allowed. Just, just call us before you do it. Um, Ask for permission, not for, for not for forgiveness. <laughs> Let's talk about it before you do it. Yeah, I, I, I operate very much the opposite in life. <laughs> However, this is one spot that I don't operate that yes. way. Yes. Um, I love that you put it that way. Um, and I, I mean, I'm part of a mastermind group and I, I had to cringe when I heard one of the, uh, one of the people in the mastermind group said, I bought an Airbnb with my checkbook LLC and my solo 401k and I get to go use it. I'm like, oh, that probably is a situation that lands somebody in hot water, I would imagine. It, it can. I mean, and the question we get to that, that's hard sometimes is people say, well, how would the IRS ever find out? 
And I don't know. I mean, there's, you know, I, I, to my knowledge, I'm sure they, they audit IRAs and 401ks here and there, probably for certain, you know, it's probably things that open up from a, a personal audit, maybe then leads them to, into looking in your IRA or 401k, but they're not out there actively cracking down on IRAs or 401ks, at least yet. So the danger of being, quote, discovered um, might be low. But the problem is, is if you engage in a prohibited transaction within your IRA account, your IRA ceases to be an IRA altogether. And you can owe taxes and back penalties for not reporting what occurred. So if you started using that Airbnb this year, personally, that you bought through your IRA account and the IRS doesn't discover it for five years from now, they'll go back to you back five years on your tax return, make you claim that income, and then also penalize you for never reporting that income. Um, and paying taxes on it. So they can actually seize your entire IRA account. So that is the, the danger. It's a very, very severe penalty if they were to discover the activity. Um, conversely, with a 401k, the penalty is actually only 15% of what was involved in the transaction. So that is another benefit of the solo K is if you do something that's considered prohibited, there's only a 15% penalty on what is involved as opposed to potentially the seizure of your, your entire IRA. So there are some other, again, that's another benefit of the solo K that I don't always talk about because I assume people are not doing things prohibited within their accounts. Um, <laughs> so I don't always bring it up, but, um, but that is that is another, that, that is, again, IRS at any point could audit your IRA accounts. I saw a client, we did have a client get audited years ago, but it all stemmed from their personal tax return um, and them claiming a contribution to their IRA when they didn't have earned income to actually support it. They sent money to us, but they hadn't actually worked that year. Um, so the IRS disallowed their contribution and then asked to audit their entire IRA account. So like little things like that can open you up kind of unexpectedly to then see what's going on inside your IRA. Mm, mm, oh my gosh. Um, so what, I guess we had talked about potentially showing some examples of how people could invest in real estate. Sure, absolutely. So we'll talk, um, so kind of some of the investment options that people have when it comes to real estate, um, really anything that people do personally, you can do inside your IRA and 401k with the exception of those self-dealing rules. You know, you can, you can certainly own an Airbnb personally and go use it if you wanted to instead of renting it. But with your IRA, that is prohibited. But people invest in rental homes, you know, commercial properties, fixer-uppers, syndications, et cetera, even raw land. Um, just a quick slide, you know, moving money, just so everybody knows if you're moving money from an IRA or a 401k at an old employer uh, or with another brokerage firm, there is no tax due uh, when you're transferring or rolling over the funds. So just make sure you're uh, aware of that. Um, but yeah, we can go through a case study here. It's just kind of the first one, just buying, say, a piece of rental property. Um, if somebody has money in their 401k, uh, there's a rental property in their neighborhood. They're looking at purchasing this uh, within their IRA account. Um, so the responsibility is, again, with a self-directed IRA, in this case, John, who is our case study, he needs to open up an account. He's going to do a rollover from that old 401k, again, tax-free uh, into the plan, and he's going to find uh, the investment property. So at Advanta IRA, we will assist certainly with getting his account open. We will assist with him getting the funds rolled over or transferred from his other custodian. But it's ultimately going to always be up to the client to find the investment property. So in advance, you know, the, the get, opening an account takes 10 minutes to fill out the paperwork. Getting the funds rolled over can take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. But ultimately, then it is going to be up to John to find the investment. We, we do not approve or disapprove of any particular investments as long as they're, they're legal. Uh, they're not violate the rules we just talked about. Um, so our role is going to be to make sure the documents for the investment get properly titled. So if he's buying a rental property, the deed to the property, the settlement statement all need to show his IRA account uh, as the buyer. But John's gonna be the one to find it and go out and look for it, do his due diligence, make the offer to purchase. And then we're gonna work with him to make sure again, the documents are titled pro properly and also make sure that he approves of them as well. So we are not going to review the settlement statement and make sure that um, you know, the, he's paying for the right things and the seller's paying for the right things. That's going to be up for him to approve, which once he does that and says, yes, everything looks good. You know, we will have worked with the title agent to get the documents. He approves them. We sign them and send the money to close. Uh, and then going forward, um, any expense that comes up for that property needs to be paid from the IRA or from the 401k. Um, any income that is generated needs to come back 
into the IRA or 401k. That's one of the roles we serve at Advantage to actually receive that money uh, in and out of the account. So as you can see on this slide, again, the property needs to be purchased in the legal name of his IRA. It's not, does it does not go in his name personally. It goes in the name of his IRA. Um, you can partner with other people. Um, so you could use part IRA funds, uh, your IRA funds. You could partner up with another investor and then split the income and expenses uh, proportionally. But all the income in this case is coming back to the IRA tax-free. There's It's just a cash purchase. Um, there was no leverage involved, therefore no UBIT. Uh, again, with any expenses, you submit those to Advanta. We get those paid out of the account. Uh, you can use a property manager uh, if you wish. But in this case study, let's say that John bought the property for 120, 150,000 or so. He's gonna gets net rent of $1,500 a month. So for two years, he's got $36,000 of cash just rolling back into his IRA account. So instead of relying on the stock market uh, for his stocks to go up or his mutual funds to produce dividends, uh, he's got his real estate actually producing a monthly dividend of $1,500 uh, right back into his account. There's no tax on that rental income. And if he sells the property, he makes a profit, there's no taxes there either. So at the end of the day, he's got over $200,000 within a few years. He took it from 150 to over $200,000 with a combination of not only the appreciation that he realized on the sale of the property, but also the net cash flow that he got uh, while he had the property rented. There is, there's no requirement that he could hold this property for any length of time. Um, so we do have people that do flip houses within their IRA account. You know, buy, pay some, the IRA buys the property, pays somebody to fix it up, property sells, all the profits come uh, back into the IRA again on a tax deferred or tax-free basis. Um, again, because there was no leverage, there is no UBIT tax on this particular example. Um, other case study I wanna talk about though is uh, doing uh, a multifamily syndication and, and using, in this case, Jane, um, who's self-employed. She's got money in an over a hundred grand in an IRA with Vanguard. Um, but she meets John, who's got you know, a private offering in an apartment complex. So that again, to Jane, she's having to make the decision, okay, do I want to leave my money invested in a mutual fund or do I like this other investment opportunity better? Is this more appealing to me to possibly put this money into a real estate syndication investment? You know, look, she looks at the returns, she reviews the prospectus, reviews the subscription documents, and ultimately decides that she wants to make this investment. And since she is self-employed, she can set up a solo 401k account. So again, because this is a syndication investment, there's going to be underlying debt. She knows that there's going to be a potential issue with that UBIT tax if she were to simply use an IRA account. But because she's self-employed or has a side business, she is able to set up the solo K and make that UBIT issue just a moot point uh, at that, for that for her. So she opens up the paperwork with us. Again, takes 10, 15 minutes to get the paperwork completed to get the 401k plan established. We will send a request to have the money transferred from Vanguard to her solo 401k uh, and notify her when the funds arrive. And then Jane's account manager, again, is gonna work with her just like in the prior example, we worked with uh, John to make sure that the closing documents show his IRA account as the owner. In this case, we need to make sure that the subscription documents for this syndication show Jane's 401k as the actual owner of this particular investment in the syndication. So the, the subscriber's name is a little bit different. So instead of holding the property or the title is Advanta IRA for benefit of so-and-so's IRA, in this case, it's gonna be Jane Smith as trustee of the JS 401k plan or whatever name she chooses. So we use the tax ID number of the 401k plan, not her social, and since Jane is trustee, she's actually going to sign the subscription documents as trustee. So she's probably filling out those subdocs, not only does the investor accreditation portion, but she's also then going to sign on behalf of the 401k plan making the investment. So all the future gains come back into her 401k. Um, the quarterly distributions over a three-year period of time, she's accrued 18 grand off her $100,000 investment. Um, when the property gets refinanced, uh, her 401k, it should say her 401k, they're not her IRA, uh, not only receives a $100,000 initial investment, plus whatever amount of profits she made when they, when they refinanced out of that property. So again, the total returns coming back to her solo 401k in a three-year period of time, 58 grand. And again, no UBIT 
because she did this. She took advantage of the fact that she was self-employed or had a side business that could justify her setting up this plan. She's able to use that plan, uh, use that business to set up a solo 401k plan and avoid any UBIT tax considerations altogether. Awesome. Um, so what, uh, one of our listeners wrote in, like, how does depreciation play into this since there's no tax liability? So when there is no tax liability for IRAs or 401ks, then depreciation does not come into the picture at all. Um, so in this example here with, with Jane, since her 401k plan is not paying tax on the gain, her 401k plan or her are not going to be able to take advantage uh, of the depreciation. The one time a retirement plan can take advantage of depreciation is in the event that you invest an IRA account into say, let's, this example was an, Jane using her IRA instead of her 401k, then she'd be subject to UBIT uh, on part of that income. If an IRA is subject to UBIT, the IRA itself can then take advantages of depreciation to limit how much UBIT tax even applies. And so that's, that's kind of, I mentioned kind of an offhand comment earlier that Sometimes too much is made of UBIT with IRA accounts because IRAs can also take deductions and depreciation to limit how much UBIT will apply. Again, 401ks, it's not necessary, uh, but with IRAs, they can take that uh, depreciation when UBIT, when, when, when UBIT applies. Um, but overall, you can't. the reason why you can't take depreciation personally is because you personally do not own the investment. Either your IRA owns it or your 401k owns it. And both of those are treated as separate legal entities uh, from yourself. Very cool. Very cool. Um, So what is there, does the loan on the syndication like um, impact this? Like if it were a recourse loan versus a non-recourse loan? Within the syndication, it wouldn't, I don't think it would matter if it's recourse or non-recourse. It's just the fact that there is underlying debt. Um, So if you're investing in somebody else's deal and that you know, the syndication, the general partners are going out and obtaining the financing. Uh, it does not matter what type of financing they get. Uh, it's a fact that the property is financed, then you're earning income is what subjects your IRA account uh, to UBIT. Um, if you were looking at using a retirement account to go and buy a single family home, uh, and then you were going to use the your retirement funds as a down payment, and you wanted to then get financing on that individual property, that is a situation where the 401k or the IRA needs to obtain what they call non-recourse financing. Essentially, non-recourse financing is the bank or the lender lending money to your IRA or to your 401k without the benefit of your personal guarantee. And so with the fact that you can't, the IRS rules do not allow you to personally guarantee the loan, because then as we talked about a minute ago, you would then be giving a benefit to your IRA or to your 401k. If you use your personal guarantee, that's gonna benefit your IRA or 401k, that's that's not allowed. So the loan has to be a non-recourse loan when your IRA or 401k is buying the property itself. And if you're investing into a syndication, you're not gonna be asked to personally guarantee the debt, so therefore it wouldn't matter. Awesome. Well, I just keep an eye on the time. And so I, I, and also I want to allow plenty of time uh, for our little after party session. So how can somebody get um, something like this set up? Like they've heard what you got to say. Sure. It's, it's very simple. It's a matter of you know, reaching out to me to get the paperwork completed and we'll help you get not only the, the documents completed to get the account open, but then also whatever paperwork needs to be done uh, to get the funds transferred. Um, here's my contact information on the last slide. Um, so reach out to me. It's, Again, it takes 10 or 15 minutes to complete the paperwork. Uh, getting funds transferred is probably going to take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, just depending on uh, who your custodian is and what type of an account you have. And we'll certainly walk you through that process uh, and to give you some expectations, some realistic expectations of, of how long that might take. Awesome. And if you, for those of you who are uh, not with us live and you, or you're not able to see it, you feel free to email me at Whitney at PassiveInvesting.com. I will forward you Scott's contact information and we'll also put it in the notes of the YouTube channel. Um, anyway, Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. I just would love wrapping up with one question. Out of sure. everything that we talked about today, what is the one thing that investors should be taking away from this conversation? I think if you're self-employed or you have a side business, 
take advantage of what a solo 401k or what a QRP can do for you, not only again in, in avoiding the UBIT tax, but also allowing you to put more money into your retirement account each year. And that's something, that, again, people look at their traditional IRA rules and say, well, putting in $6,000 a year, that's just, that's going to take a while for me to build up to be able to do anything with. But when you are self employed, the solo 401k, as we showed, allows you to put up to $61,000 a year uh, into that type of plan. And not only can you get that money working for you then under, on a tax deferred basis, putting the money into that plan will also give you a pretty hefty write off on your individual and business tax returns as well. So again, if you're self-employed, you should be having that discussion with your CPA or your tax advisor of what can I do to boost my retirement uh, accounts and boost basically the, the amounts that I have in there and also giving me a, a de current deduction as well, limit, limiting in how much my taxes are paying. If, and if your CPA isn't talking to you about that or doesn't wanna to talk to you about that, then I would, I would suggest you know, finding maybe another resource to be honest. So because that, that's a very important, Part of the puzzle i think every cpa should be talking to their clients about awesome again thank you so much scott this has been amazing information you guys reach out to scott at avanta ira if you have any additional questions don't go anywhere we're going to be around for our after party and just for you guys that do need to scoot um thank you so much for joining with me live you can find me at passive investing whitney uh, .com for future master classes and to schedule a session with me until then, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Whitney.